You know, I love podcasting. I have since 2006, back when you had to use like a Dixie cup with string to make the thing work. And that's why I'm so excited that we recently moved Mysterious Goings On to Anchor FM to record our podcast. I got to tell you, I don't regret it a bit. If you haven't heard about Anchor, it's the easiest way to make a podcast. Let me explain. First of all, it's free. There's creation tools that allow you to record and edit your podcast right from your phone or computer. Anchor will distribute your podcast for you so it can be heard on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and many more. And you can make money from your podcast with no minimum listenership. It's everything you need to make a podcast all in one place. Not going to lie to you, when I first heard about Anchor, I was a little dubious because I've been doing it the hard way for so long. But I got to tell you, it's very easy. Use a Stripe account get sponsors, you're not paying monthly hosting fees, the sound quality is great, the distribution is phenomenal. Friends, download the free Anchor app today if you want to start your own podcast or go to anchor.fm to get started. Remember, you heard it here first on Mysterious Goings On. Welcome to Mysterious Goings On. I'm Alex Greenwood. Well, we have another great author interview ahead on this episode, and I couldn't be more excited because this book, which is just being released here in July, it's it's being released uh, Amazon UK for sure, and we'll ask him more, but we're going to talk to Aldo Chanuto about his new book, The Curse of Knowing, and I want to tell you something, folks. I haven't gotten my hands on it just yet because it's brand new, but I've read up on it, and I've seen some excerpts, and I want to tell you something. I am just really excited to get my hands on this book, and I think you're going to enjoy meeting Aldo. So without further ado, Aldo Chanuto, welcome to Mysterious Goings On. Hi, Alex. Thank you for having me. My it's a pleasure. great pleasure to be here. Oh, well, it's, it's my pleasure. Now, where are you talking to us from at this very moment? It's a beautiful place where I'm now. It's uh, uh, close to Portofino on the uh, coast of uh, Liguria, which is northern Italy, um, by the sea, basically. Uh, and so it, it's a beautiful day, summer day. Uh, I can see the the sea from my oh my goodness window and and so i'm sorry about that <laughs> Many people probably would, would say oh why is this guy uh bragging about the place where but you know this is a place th this is the perfect place where to write a book I, I can I can relate. Uh, one of the best times I ever had was staying with friends in Laguna Beach, California, and they had a seaside home. And just looking out and seeing the ocean while I was writing was very inspirational to me. And please don't feel bad at all. You're not, as we say in America, rubbing it in or anything. I just love to hear about it. And by your accent, I'm, I thought you probably were not from Iowa. Well, exactly. This must be specified. Well, unfortunately, you cannot put uh, the, the subtitles because it's a podcast. Uh, but I hope, <laughs> I hope people will understand me just the same. Yeah, I'm from Italy. And, uh, and uh, I actually divide my life between uh, uh, the place where I'm now, uh, mm -hmm. which is Camogli. Uh, it's a beautiful village, beautiful. And, uh, and uh, central London, where I... Uh, spend at least three, four months a year, at least sometimes, sometimes more, which is also a very inspiring place uh, for, for writing and, uh, and, and not just that. I mean, uh, I think London is a perfect place where you can uh, work, but also even better if you, uh, if you don't have to take the tube every morning. Um, and, and so, I mean, I, I, I love, there as well a lot yeah i spent quite a bit of time in london um i used to be attached to someone from there and spent a great deal of time there and i was enchanted by it i i enjoyed being there very much i miss it i miss it terribly i wonder and uh, we'll, we'll ask the obligatory question if you don't mind how is it going in italy with the with covid19 how how is your particular area faring well um 
this particular place where um, now has been basically and it remained un un unscathed and touched by the coronavirus. I mean, this village, there have been three cases and no people died. Um, but you know, uh, Italy, uh, everybody knows about Italy. Uh, it, it, it has been the first Western country to be hit by coronavirus. Uh, and so, I mean, everybody was looking at Italy at the beginning, uh, in a very concerned way. Then, uh, then now, nobody talks about Italy uh, any longer because uh, you know there are other countries that unfortunately are. Uh, yeah, I know, I know. Sadly, and, yes. Uh, and so now, now we we are going. I mean, I I, I I I didn't want to use the word normal because I find it so boring actually because everybody talks about new normal normal old normal <laughs> the future no I, I mean i don't know uh, it, it's not you you perceive that something uh, there is a, a deep mutation a di deep change in, in, within the society uh, and so i mean even though now in this precise moment uh, uh, um, people People have started to uh, to not not wear all the time a mask. I mean, they right. don't need to, to to wear it all the time. It's not compulsory hmm. um, anymore. At least uh, as long as you are in an open space. If you if you go into a shop, you have to, of course. But uh, I mean, you perceive the difference in the attitude of the people, and uh, and so I mean, things are getting much better now. Uh, and but despite this, let me see. It's the virus is even though it's is not in the air, it's still in the air. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, and this is uh, you know, but we must get used to it. By the way, I was in London when uh, when the whole thing started, uh, and I left London. I remember because uh, we were concerned about what was happening here in Italy, and. Uh, the day we left, my wife and myself, we left from London was uh, March the 9th. And, uh, and it, was, it was very weird because a lot of people were already dying in Italy, but London was totally normal. I mean, people taking the tube, the, the, the cars grab, uh, uh, crammed with, packed with people, uh, people shaking hands, uh, hugging, normal. And we say, wow, but why i mean why nobody here cares about what's happening so, so not they care but mm. they don't take any so we were a little bit puzzled by this by this and unfortunately uh, then we realized that uh, um, the uk went uh, 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 through a similar path as as us right. uh, in some ways even worse which is very sad because I mean we have been the first uh, Italy has been the first country, uh, uh, but you know it, it, it. And so everybody could uh, could take uh, uh, that our case as an example to do different things and to do better than us. Yeah. But unfortunately, uh, that was not the case. It certainly wasn't the case in the United States. We did not learn well. We did not learn our lesson from uh, the the horrific tragedy that that befell your country. But I, I, although I appreciate you sharing that, and I, I I know the last thing you want to talk about probably was COVID. But I just couldn't resist asking you. Um, you're the first person from Italy I've spoken with in in all year, so it's really interesting to hear your perspective. And I'm very glad to hear that your particular village is is virtually unscathed and and uh, things are well. Um, uh, so let's let's turn the page, shall we? Um, and let's talk about the curse of knowing. I I want to. How? What kind of book is this? Is this? I mean, okay, let me just step back. I'm going to just do this, if that's okay. I do this sometimes and embarrass authors by reading a little bit of their book. Is that okay with you? If I do read a little section? Oh, absolutely. Okay, absolutely. I'm going to go from the beginning. All right, now uh, and. And, and gentle listeners know that I'll do the best I can. And so far, I've been pretty good on my pronunciation of Italian names, but um, hopefully he'll forbear any butchering. All right, so here we go. Um, chapter one, Rome, present day. 
My name is Vittoria Armieri. I work at the Ministry of Cultural Heritage, and I know everything. If you feel safe, well, you aren't. I know everything about you, too, beginning with who you are and what your name is. I can tell where you are right now, what you do for a living, and whom you fantasized about just minutes ago. Like so many of the things that I know about you and anybody else, these are trivialities. These are facts that nobody cares about, least of all me. So I treat them like gnats that are buzzing around. I wait for them to fly off without even bothering to wave them away. But things are different when I come across a murderer, like the guy on the bench opposite. I'm not talking about the older man with thick glasses. He is as clean as a whistle. In fact, he deserves compassion. At age 12, he was beaten unconscious by three seniors of his boarding school, and a year later, he was raped by a janitor. He has always kept it from everyone, denying it even to himself. But it happened. I know it did. Anyway, I was talking about the man sitting next to him, the guy in the blue coat who is now devouring his sandwich. His name is Domenico Morgelli, and he's 64. Back when he used to inflict on human beings the same savagery that he's now reserving for his food, he slaughtered a young man and a girl in their 20s. It's no coincidence that he was christened Dom the Butcher by the whole of Rome at the time of his crime. Ladies and gentlemen, how do you read those paragraphs and not just dive in and read the whole thing as fast as you can? I, Aldo, seriously, uh, I, I don't like to, to, uh, to be too effusive, but sincerely, I'm hooked already on this book. Oh, I take it as a compliment. <laughs> <laughs> you should. <laughs> um, thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, especially because I, uh, it, it's so great. Uh, to listen to someone who's reading in English something that I wrote in English. Also, because let me say, it's, it's not my, I, I'm not a, a native English speaker. I mean, it is not necessary to say, but uh, maybe, maybe it, it's interesting to know why I decided to write a book in English. Uh, I'm, I don't know. I'm, I mean, you tell me if it is something. Well, first of all, you, you anticipated my next question. Ah, okay. Okay, okay. So, so how about we go there, and then I want, I want to talk about why in English, and then what kind of book is this? You know, is it a thriller? Is it horror? Is it a mystery? We'll go into all of that. But please, take it away, Aldo. Let's, let's hear what your thoughts are on the origins of this book. Okay. Uh, I think the, the, the way to um, define it better is, is to call it a psychological drama. Um, it, it is, but it is not completely, completely correct in the sense that uh, there is some drama, there is some tragedy, and uh, and uh, and also, uh, you know, there is a. Uh, uh, let's say, uh, the book has uh, several um, facets, several uh, way ways of approaching the story. So, uh, of course, it's a, it's a tragedy because this woman, um, she is, uh, uh, one could say that she's blessed with the power of uh, reading other people's lives, hmm. uh, accessing their thought, she can access their thought, their memories, their tragedies, but to her, this is no super superpower. It's not a superpower at all. It's actually a curse, mm -hmm. and uh, and her life is so miserable uh, because of this uh, that her only aspiration is to die. And she, and the most important thing that she wants, she wants to die at the ends of a murderer. And there is a reason for this. She doesn't want to die in an ordinary way. She doesn't want to, to take her own life. She wants to die. And, and the story develops, unfolds uh, uh, from this premise, which, is, which starts in the first pages. Exactly in the, the following page after the, 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 the part that you have read. So, so I mean, I'm, I'm not uh, spot spoiling uh, the story. I'm just telling what's, what happens in the first, in the first pages. But also, it's, it's also, um, despite being a tragedy, it's also a story of uh, love and friendship. I, I, I don't want to 
tell more about this because otherwise I risk to to really uh, tell too much. Right. And and, and you know it, it make the book less interesting. I, I want people to develop to to discover this by reading it. And uh, and that's basically uh, as I said there are several faces because she is she's an happy. She's miserable. She wants to die. Uh, nevertheless, she's very sarcastic because this, this kind of a, a curse uh, puts her in a position to be, you know, disenchanted uh, towards life. Uh, people have no secrets in front of her. Uh, they bear in front of her. So, I mean, because of this, she, she can look at them uh, from a completely different perspective, not just at the people, but at life as well. So that, that, that's the scenario where the, the book starts. Well, okay, and I think that's perfect. We don't have to go into plot points, of course, we, and we don't like to do that anyway, because it'll give it away. I want this to be a rich, uh, juicy read for everyone, because as I said, those first few paragraphs I read, I seriously, although I was just, I was just like, oh my gosh, I love the premise. I love that you can read already that she's world weary and she has this superpower, but it's, it's actually a misery for her. I love all of this. So, but let's talk about you and the writing of the book. Now you said this is your first book in English. Let me just take a step back first though. Your career has been based in, as you said, in advertising. In fact, you've been a creative director. Is that correct? Correct. Yes, correct. So, yes, I've been a creative director. I started as a copywriter in uh, in, an, in an agency in Florence uh, many many years ago, uh, and then I moved to Milan, where, which is the the capital of the advertising industry. It's not Rome, it's Milan. So I moved to Milan, and uh, and then I I went through the usual process of uh, uh, you know from, uh, from a, a, a small agency to a, a larger agency to a big agency. Um, and uh, in parallel, my career was developing. So from assist, assistant copywriter to junior copywriter, then to vice creative director, and then to creative director, and then to vice president of a, of a large, um, of some of the, the major uh, advertising agencies in Italy. Uh, uh, I'm talking about, maybe you, you heard this name, uh, international agency like uh, Magnetics and YNR, y Young Arabicum. Oh called. yeah, yeah, YNR, yeah. sure. And, um, and, uh, and Low, Low Group, which is uh, British actually uh, uh, agency. At the beginning, it was a British network. Uh, and then, um, Ten years ago, uh, I founded, uh, I co-founded, together with my uh, art director partner Roberto Pizzigoni and Barbara Rioli, I co-founded my own agency. So our own agency, which is Cernuto Pizzigoni and Partners, uh, which was a, a fantastic adventure. It still uh, is, uh, but the launch, especially, it has been very exciting. What kind of clients do you generally serve? Well, you know, uh, having, th this is the, the a question that when, when people ask me, what, what clients did you work with? Uh, I'd say all of them. <laughs> in, terms, in, terms, in terms of uh, industries, all of them. So there, I think there, there are no industries, uh, not kind of a, no clients that I didn't work for. Of course, the, the names uh, that, uh, I mean, are internationally known are uh, Volvo, uh, Alfa Romeo, Saab, um, uh, uh, Barilla, uh, and then many, many telecom uh, companies, it Italian and not Italian. Um, uh, I, I mean, uh, it's difficult for me to, to uh, because, yeah, Subaru also, many oh, cars, sure. yeah. ma many cars, yeah, yeah. Um, and, uh, and other brands that maybe are uh, less popular in the United States, uh, 
uh, like uh, in, in, the, in the design industry, uh, Artemide, which makes uh, uh, lamps, hmm. uh, designed lamps. So, I mean, uh, it, it's really difficult to find uh, some products or, or, um, or uh, services that I didn't work for. Yeah, I, it, very much a generalist approach. Uh, I'm my day job, public relations, um, and I people ask me the same thing. Do you specialize? And typically, I did not for the first decades of my career, but now I do simply because I'm a small shop. But uh, so I, I was just curious, and I, I just have to say, having formerly owned a Saab, I was so sad to see it go down. I was wow. so disappointed. Ugh. Wow, the same, same here, yeah. same here. Also because I, I worked for them uh, many years ago several years ago. of course now they don't exist anymore any longer and uh, and um, I, it was a fantastic car one of the best car i've ever driven okay. which do you have did you have uh, can, can i ask you i had a two, i had a 2001 saab 93 ah yeah great car convertible uh, i had i had that too for a for a period because of course uh, yeah uh, as we had we were managing the client. We were uh, given the car to, uh, which was a, a great uh, perk. <laughs> oh man, yeah. No, I, I, it was beautiful. Metallic, uh, that metal, that wonderful metallic, uh, bluish metallic gray color. It's convertible. It, it just worked uh, like a dream. It had. All, they just thought about cars in a different way than most yeah. car makers. But it unfortunately wasn't sustainable. But forgive me for going off track there. But so you you let, started. Let say, it, it's it's not because of, of uh, the kind of uh, advertising that we did that. Uh, <laughs> no, it I, wasn't I, your fault. <laughs> I, I it was because General Motors bought the brand and mishandled it probably more than anything. I'm afraid so. Yeah. Uh, my dad worked for General Motors for 25 years. I, I know a little bit about them. Um, but I will go back to the, to the so being, of course, uh, you started your creative life and your, your money raking life writing with, with words. Um, had you written fiction prior to The Curse of Knowing? Well, y yes, I did. Uh, because uh, I, I think you cannot, uh, you cannot even think of uh, publishing a, a novel without having uh, written something before. I, actually, previously, I, I wrote three novels, which are still in a drawer here. Uh, I sent one to a publisher 10 years ago, um, where I received a lot of compliments. Ah, beautiful story, fantastic uh, uh, idea. We love the way, in Italian, it was written in Italian. It's brilliant, uh, very intelligent, but thanks, but no thanks, we are not interested. Uh, which is the, the classic uh, type of answer that all people from all over the world receive when they send a first piece of work to a publisher. But at that point I said, oh, okay. Uh, uh, I mean, is, is this... Uh, interesting for me. Uh, I mean, I loved uh, writing it. I had fun. Uh, let's put it in a drawer and let's leave it there for a while. You know, my, my, my principle, my idea is that uh, you, you cannot write. I don't know, you are a writer as well, so I, I, I want to share this with you. You cannot write a, a novel if you haven't uh, written at least one million words and uh, thrown them away. Thrown them away because they're not worth, they're not good enough. Um, if you have done that, then you can start challenging you in something that uh, it's worth being read, it's worth being published, and especially it's worth being read. Yeah. A million words, I love that. I don't think I've ever heard that before. I, uh, you had not heard? Well, uh, no, it's not. It's not mine. I must. Uh, I must confess. This is not mine. I read. I read this and I said, "Well, I totally agree." I mean, but you know, working in, in advertising means that you have to throw away a lot of ideas. Sometimes they are great, but but and sometimes clients not always accept great ideas. Yeah. 
I'll say the opposite, actually. <laughs> yeah, true. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and uh, um, and so I mean, it, I was kind of used to uh, to get rid of uh, ideas that I had uh, uh, come up with. Uh, so I said, this is not enough. The book is not enough. Then I started with this uh, and I started in Italian. I'm, I must say, I'm, I'm telling you, I, I started writing in Italian. Um, and then I understood that the story maybe deserved something different, a different twist. Uh, I can tell you something about, about this uh, switch from Italian to English because, um, you, you know, if I'm boring, you interrupt me, eh? uh, Alex, please, you <laughs> can say, I will stop it. <laughs> <laughs> please uh, don't, go ahead. But, but you know, uh, you, you, as a person that works in with uh, ideas yourself, uh, you know that uh, working with ideas, you start learning how your mind works. Is that true? So, true. I mean, and, and after uh, doing this for a long while, I know how my, my mind works. I think I know how my mind, I, I can make some mistakes also, but there are things that um, regard my, the way my brain works that I know. And, you know, uh, I, I know that my work, my, my brain is sometimes a bit contrived. It, it is sometimes a bit contrived, which is not great for someone who works in advertising because you have to simplify everything. Everything is, is, is contrived at the beginning and you have to make it simple right. and to deliver it to, to, to people. Uh, so I, I think I was not born for working in advertising. <laughs> uh, but nevertheless, uh, I made it and um, I learned because you learn to be creative also. This, this is an important thing. People think that either you have talent or not. Right. It's right. not true. You learn. And you, you talked sometimes about this, uh, mm -hmm. um, this uh, issue I uh, heard in, in other episodes. Um, I, and, uh, and so um, what, what is the difference between writing in English, writing in Italian and writing in English? Well, when I write in English, I'm somehow obliged to simplify. I, I'm obliged to simplify my language uh, because I, I, um, I don't know. My vocabulary is pretty good, is rich enough, but it's not as rich as it is in Italian, of course, because we, for obvious reasons. Okay, l let me, uh, between brackets, I had uh, a... a, a an English speaking editor, English speaking, native English speaking editor, of course, yeah. uh, uh, polishing all my work and improving it and making it uh, work where it didn't, because I, otherwise it would have been impossible for me. But basically, my, uh, the flow of the story, when, when I write in English, becomes uh, easier. Uh, which is good uh, uh, for different uh, aspects. First of all, the fact that uh, this is the, the way that uh, is mostly accepted. Uh, so short, short sentences, um, uh, straight to the point, uh, uh, not too many adverbs, not too many adjectives. So, Basically, I discovered that uh, I am a better writer in English than uh, in, uh, in Italian. Oh. Um, or, or, or at least some people said that. I mean, I, I, I like to think they're right. <laughs> 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 so that, that, that's the reason why. Um, uh, and and uh, in the end, uh, it, it has been a fantastic experience for me. Well, if what I just what I've sampled already is any indication, and your editor has done a marvelous job working with you to polish these things, but the the, the turns of phrase, the the way it it just flowed so 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 damn well, I just really think it's excellent. I mean, I I I don't ever tell guests that oh I love your book if I don't, and so um, I, I always say nice things, but I like oh it's, I'm sure this is very interesting, but this is really those that. You know, it says so much that those first few paragraphs had just grabbed my attention so well. 
Um, uh, during this horrible lockdown we're in, I have a stack of books this high, not to mention my Kindle uh, to read. And I've had such fuzziness because I, everything's just a little up in the air and strange. And I've had a hard time focusing. But I remember as I sat down to look at the excerpts of your book, I thought, wow, this is one I want to keep getting into. I want to dig into. So, so cheers to you on that, sir. I think it's, it's magnificent the way you're doing that. Um, let me ask you a little bit about process, if I may. And I, I know these are tedious questions for writers, but a lot of writers who listen to the show want to hear about your process. First of all, if you don't mind telling us, uh, about how long did it take you to, to write The Curse of Knowing? And how did you do it? Did you do it daily? Is there a certain place you wrote? Is there anything you want to tell us about how, how you do it? Sure. Um, it took uh, to me uh, some uh, five months um, to, to finish it. Um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm a very disciplined person. When I decide that uh, I have to wake up at four in the morning, I do that. Wow. And, uh, and uh, uh, also because I think the morning is, I mean, many writers, many people who work with ideas, uh, I, I'm sure will agree with me, uh, best ideas come in the morning. And uh, sometimes your brain has worked all, all night long, you, you didn't, didn't even realize that. But, uh, and then uh, when you wake up, uh, you have the, those ha-ha moments where you say, oh yes, th that, that's what I was looking for. Um, and uh, so I'm not the kind of uh, uh, whiskey and uh, nighttime uh, working with no smokes. No, 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 no. <laughs> no I, I, I wake up early morning before even having breakfast, I start writing and uh, I, I, I write at least uh, two hours, three hours in the morning and two hours uh, in the afternoon, in the early afternoon. And then uh, the last uh, uh, hour before, uh, before going to sleep, uh, I review, I edit all what uh, I have written during the day. I know this is not something you should do. Everybody says, no, that's wrong. You edit at the end. You don't edit day by day. I don't know, you, you, you Alex, what, what do you do? Well, I was going to say, actually, I, I was taught that you should not. My, my grandfather was a writer for 50 years, and he, he, did, he said, I don't do anything. I write the draft, then I go back. But I found, but he didn't have, he didn't have computers. He didn't have word processing. I, I have found that I'll write my bit for the day, usually a minimum of 1,000 words, and then the next day when I go back to write, I reread what I did and I start, I start doing what I call micro editing of that. Um, I try not to go overboard because if I spend an hour micro editing that piece, I won't get to my next thousand words. So that's, that's how I do it. Well, this is also, I think it's, it's a great method. The only reason why I edit in the, in the, uh, before the night, before going to sleep is that uh, otherwise, you know what happens, that I wake up, I read what I had written the day before, and I get depressed. Oh. <laughs> because I said, oh, no, well, no, it doesn't work. Instead, if I, if I make it work at night, then I, I, in the morning, I, I, I go through what I quickly, just to put my brain in, in, uh, in the way, the right way. And I say, well, okay, it works. I can go uh, ahead with this. So it's just, you know, I like, you know, our brains, um, they trick us sometimes, but you can also learn how to trick your brain. Um, and I, 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 I have a passion for this, uh, for this uh, thing uh, in the sense I, I, I like reading book about, uh, uh, about how the mind and the brain works, work uh, together, combined, uh, how ideas, I, I actually wrote a, an, a, a book years ago about um, uh, how ideas are born in advertising. I wrote mm -hmm. a, a, a book which was uh, Il Mal d'Idea, The Idea Ache, several, several years ago. Uh, because it's, it's a passion. I, I, I like, I, I love to understand uh, the process of, uh, of the, um, the human brain, the, the, according the way the, the human brain works and elaborate and work works out ideas. 
So that leads me to another question then. Um, did, do you have, do you outline or do you, do you just establish the character and then let, let the story go every day? Or do you have an, do you have a, I guess I should say, do you have an end in sight when you first sit down to write the book? Um, I don't know. I think probably I had, but I don't know. In, in the sense, uh, let, let, I, 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 this is an interesting question. I, you know, there are, as you certainly know, maybe you are one of them, there are writers who are kind of engineers of, of the stories. They, they know exactly what is going to happen, every, every character. And, but in my view, and I, I mean, uh, of course, this is the first uh, um, novel that I published, but the, the, I learned this from my previous experiences. I believe that characters have their own lives. They, they don't want you to uh, um, predestine. Uh, no, I, I, I don't know how to say this uh, in English because it's not, it's not, you, you don't want uh, to uh, decide in advance what they're going to do next. Yeah. They, they have to decide. So of course, so everything is in my, into my, within my brain, and, and, but, but I don't push them to do things that do, they don't want to do. So this is way, the way I usually, I have the story in mind, but I'm ready to, to, to bend it a little bit, to change direction, to, to, to drive to an, another, uh, towards a place that I didn't think of, before or so i mean i mean i i'm not the kind of person uh who knows the ending uh precisely in the moment uh, in which they write the first paragraph it's not it's not my attitude it's not my yeah i couldn't agree with you more i'm the same i i don't want to straightjacket my characters because i don't want to be writing something with a predestination in mind and then what if I'm writing something and then, as you said, the character has a life of its own and it kind of just organically as I'm writing wants to do something else. I'm, I can't be the one saying, no, no, stop, because at the end, I want you to be here. I just let it go. I, as I've said this before many times, forgive me if you've you heard the shows when I've mentioned this. Uh, I think I said this to Adriana as well, uh, one of our recent guests and Bert, another recent guest, um, writers. I, I like to have characters that are full and rich and my books are thrillers, and I like to put them in thrilling or mysterious situations and let them figure it out. That's how I like to do it. Yeah. It sounds like that's what you're up to. I completely agree with you. I am totally with you in, in, in this sense. Also because, you know, I'm sure people sometimes ask you, as they ask me, where did your inspiration come from? This kind of question about inspiration. But, you know, inspiration is not, it's not mathematics. It's not uh, um, a list of things that you have to do that you want and that you have to make uh, uh, to adapt to the situation. Inspiration is means to me it means leaving your mind free of thinking, and 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 that is the moment where inspiration hits you, uh, strikes you. <laughs> right. Uh, this is the way I see it. Yeah. Do you, um, uh, I, I, I've discussed this with a lot of authors. Do you find yourself when you're doing, uh, taking a walk, a stroll to the store, uh, the market, do you ever, does something hit you out of the blue or does it all work on you when you're at the keyboard or at the page? No, absolutely. Because, uh, you know, uh, I, I know this uh, from, from experience. Uh, your mind never stops working. You, when, the moment you give uh, an input to your mind, Whatever you're doing, uh, even though you, you think that you're not thinking of that problem, your mind is at work. And it's a, it is working to find uh, a solution. And usually, I know this uh, working in, in advertising, you know, you, 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 you need ideas. Ideas come when you least expect them. Uh, they can come while you are at the grocery stop or, or you're going to the bathroom or, or you, uh, to the... To the laboratory or I, so i mean uh, yeah I, I i i think it is uh, that that kind of uh, 
situation. What, uh, if anything, and I know this is your first novel, but that doesn't mean it's, it's obviously not your first words, as we discussed, you've been writing your entire life. If, to the writers out there who have not started or have not finished their first novel, um, I, like you, have three or four in a drawer that, that didn't go anywhere, and that's where they'll stay. So that's, that's a lot of the work you put into it. But, but what about the writer out there listening right now who thinks, I think I've got something here. I just don't know how to make it happen. You've already mentioned you're extremely disciplined, which is very obvious from how you describe, described your routine. But is there any advice you would offer the new writer or the want-to-be writer? Um, yes. Uh, I, I have a piece of... Uh, there is something I believe uh, uh, it, it is very important for whoever uh, starts writing a book. Never, ever tell your idea of a book to anyone keep it for yourself because if you talk to someone else and you say uh, oh i'm writing a book uh, well, what is it uh, about well it is about and you start telling the story your brain thinks great mission accomplished you have done it you don't <laughs> have to think of that anymore and and it is the death of the idea. It's the death of, of the novel. So you have to suffer uh, to brace yourself in a way and, uh, and suffer uh, to, to, to give birth to the idea. Only when it's done, you can talk. Yeah, Stephen King in his book about writing said, you write with the door closed. In other words, you don't open the door when you're writing until you have a draft to show to a beta reader or an editor. But you, this is what you're saying, isn't it? You write with the door closed. You don't talk about it. You don't say, how are these pages I wrote today? You wait until it's the proper time. I love that the way you framed that, though, Aldo. That is so good and useful because... I don't talk about my work because I feel like I'm boring people anyway. You know, my, <laughs> my wife, you know, she, she reads it, but you know, uh, you know, so I, when people ask me what I'm working on, I just say my character, John Pilot, I say, John's in another mess. And when you, when it's done, you can read all about it and I leave it alone. But I like what you just said there because it's almost as if you talk about it, you're draining a battery or you're, or even just in the talking about it, you could be malignantly changing how the story's gonna go based on the reaction of the person you're telling it to. Is that something? Yes? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Wow. And wow. It, it, it can be very uh, counterproductive. It can be dangerous. Uh, so, I mean, it's not, uh, of course, Stephen King, I mean, uh, who can, uh, uh, he's right, uh, the door closed. I, I said, yeah, door closed, mouth shut, uh, every every, every uh, hole or sphincter of your body, <laughs> your pores. Uh, you you must not nobody because it 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 must be a mystery to the other. Yeah, and then you unveil the mystery, and that that, that is the most beautiful moment. I know we're running low on time here, so I want to just ask you a couple of quick uh, wrap-up questions, and then we'll make sure we mention where people can buy the book. But now that you have this done, and I know it's early days, you've just released the book, correct, in July, right? Um, just a yesterday. Few, yesterday. Yesterday. As a matter, yeah, as we record this on July 15th, yes, it was launched. Yet. But this is the question all writers get that we kind of dread, especially the day after we've released our book. But what's next? Exactly. I, I'm not going to tell you. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Perfect. You, you did not fall into my trap at all. <laughs> exactly. It was a treat. It was. It was. It was. It it was. was. Uh, no, I'm sure won't, I have ideas and I want to uh, start writing uh, immediately. Um, tomorrow. Uh, I won't do that tomorrow, but uh, um, I, I never stop writing, basically. But I haven't started a new novel yet, but I have ideas and uh, uh, they are somehow uh, moving inside my head, not, not in a clear way yet, but I, I, there are, I mean, I, once you start writing, you can't, you, you can stop. I can stop. 
Right. Well, and, and I would be disappointed if you'd had any other answer to that question. That was perfect. That was perfect. I expected that. I, I can't, but I almost, I thought, oh, I'm going to get him on that one. But nope, you did. Um, the, 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 the Curse of Knowing, this is by Aldo Cernuto. It is, let's see, it's published by, who is your publisher? I'm sorry, I, I'm, I'm missing that, that work there. The Clink Street Publish. Ah, Pub Clink Street. The Clink Street Publishing. And it's available Amazon.com, Europe, yeah. everywhere, or uh, all Amazons, all Amazons across the world, um, and some other uh, online uh, bookstores, several other uh, online so, bookstores. Yeah. Paperback and ebook. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And do you have a website or anything we should point to at this point? Oh no! Everybody, my publisher included, and my editor told me you should have a. a a, a website. Uh, no, I have a, a, a Facebook uh, author page, which oh, okay. uh, which I didn't want to, to open as well, but uh, <laughs> they told me you want to. And I have a central author Amazon page, right? Which is uh, another way of. Uh, but you know, uh, I don't like much that that kind of thing. Uh, I have two, but. Uh, I have other ideas on uh, how I would like to tell my story to all the people one by one. Not <laughs> well, and, and I, although I do appreciate being one of the ones by one that you told the story to, and by extension, all of our listeners here on Mysterious Goings On, I will leave you with the last word. Is there anything I didn't ask you about that I should have, or any last words you'd like to impart to the uh, listeners? Well, uh, you, you, you asked me, but let me say something funny about me. Okay. <laughs> uh, uh, if ideas come uh, when I'm working or when I'm going around strolling or whatever, uh, there is a, a technique that I have. Every now and then I stop working because I understand that I have to, to, to take a pause. And the, the best thing you can do in, in such situations is uh, you open the door, you go outside, you walk a lot, and you come back. But you, no, you but it takes a lot, uh, and then you 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 break your you, you you. It's not good for. So there is one thing that I do. Don't, don't laugh, please. I juggle. I juggle. You juggle. Yes, I do. It's funny, huh? isn't it? You, you, oh, I think it's funny if you tell me what you juggle. Three balls. Okay. okay. <laughs> not five. Not five because otherwise it takes too much to learn that and I cannot write. But three balls is perfect because you clean your mind, you clean your mind, you, you are focused on what you're doing. I try different tricks, several different tricks. I, I do that for 15 minutes and then I go back uh, to, to my computer. I'll have to try that, although... Um... I guess I shouldn't start with uh, knives or chainsaws, or should I? No. Well, well, I, I don't recommend that. <laughs> I'm sure your wife wouldn't agree with that. <laughs> yeah, it would, it would be terrible if we made it through lockdown, but I managed to off myself by juggling with the chainsaw. Aldo Cernuto, author of this wonderful new book that I am so excited to tell you about, uh, The Curse of Knowing. And Folks, this one, seriously, if what I read to you, trip your trigger, go to Amazon.com, click on the book. Uh, there'll be links in the show notes. Read more, and you can read it without my voice rattling in your ears, which is probably superior. Read it in your own voice, and, of course, uh, Aldo's voice as well. Sir, it has been a genuine pleasure. I would like to extend to you the open invitation to return when you come back with your next book. I'd love to have you back if you had any fun at all oh, today. thank you. I appreciate that. This is another good reason for starting another one. Ah, very good. Aldo Trinito, thank you for being on Mysterious Goings On. And don't forget, you can look for the show notes for Mysterious Goings On for this wonderful interview and all the rest at mgopod.com. That's mgopod.com. Also, there's an opportunity there for you to be a supporter of the show for less than the price of a cappuccino. You can support us every month, and but you don't have to. If you don't want to, you don't have to. I understand times are tough, but we'd love to get your support. There'll be links to that in the show notes as well. Again, my thanks to Aldo Chanuto. I'm looking forward to this book. And until next time, good listeners, Thank you. keep reading. 
<laughs> now is the chance to use reliable energy to grow your money with the Dominion Energy Reliability Investment. Our new investment product offers competitive returns, no maintenance fees, and flexible online access to your money. Make the reliable investment in reliable energy. The Dominion Energy Reliability Investment. To find out more, go online to reliabilityinvestment.com. That's reliabilityinvestment.com. From regular expenses to occasional splurges, there's a lot to buy. Why not get cash back every time you spend? With the PenFed Power Cash Rewards Card, you get cash back on every purchase. That's everywhere, every time you use it. You can even earn a $100 statement credit when you spend $1,500 in the first 90 days. Visit PenFed.org slash PowerCash to apply. To receive any advertised product, you must become a member of PenFed, insured by NCUA. 